Need some books for this one today. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and today we're looking at some old English translations, and in particular, the impact of what five words can have on the Bible. So if you like these videos, be sure to subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment or a question down below. I really try to reply to those. That is one way that you can really help me and see this channel grow. In 1536, William Tyndale was burned at the stake in Antwerp. Why was he burned? And what does that mean for us today? We need to back up a little bit and think about the King James translation. When the King James Version was first published in 1611, it was a great translation. But this was not the first English translation. In 1384, John Wycliffe translated almost the entire Bible into English. Unfortunately, those in power banned owning even a small portion of Wycliffe's Bible or any other version of the Bible in English. To be caught in possession of an English translation was punishable by death. Even though the printing press was not yet invented and it was illegal to own a copy of Wycliffe's translation, a surprising number of hand-copied manuscripts were produced. Over 100 years later, the young William Tyndale picked up Wycliffe's task to produce a translation of the Bible into English. Now the big advantage that Tyndale had over Wycliffe was the advent of the printing press. Tyndale lived during the tumultuous times of the Reformation. This was both a time of religious and political dissent, often both in the same movement. Now Tyndale was sort of a savant. He studied at Cambridge and then Oxford, where the impact of Luther's work was being studied with a careful eye. He was a gifted linguist. He was fluent in English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. But because of the laws banning any owning of a portion of the Bible in English, Tyndale had to flee to the European continent in order to produce a translation of the New Testament. Now at first it seems like he spent some time in Germany with the leaders of the Reformation there before moving to the Netherlands to do most of his work. Tyndale had two aims in his translation. The first was emancipation to break the bonds of how the Christian religion was being practiced and taught in his day. Tyndale realized that in order to accomplish this, certain key terms needed to be translated differently from the way that they were currently taught during his day in order for the reader to properly grasp the message of the Bible. His translation presented an implicit critique of the accepted readings of the Bible practices of the church and called for a new understanding, teaching, and application of its sacred message. Tyndale's second aim was illumination. Much of his translation sprang from his studies of the Bible in the original languages, but he also made use of Erasmus's and Luther's work. For example, Erasmus's annotations on the Greek New Testament was incredibly important for Tyndale, who had studied at Cambridge, where Rasmus taught for a while. Tyndale's goal was to retrieve the original meaning of the Bible and convey it in a manner that spoke to the people of his day. He's famous for his line, if God spare my life ere these many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. Or to put it into modern English, if God spares my life these many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scripture than you do. In 1525, he produced his first copy of the New Testament in English, and you can actually buy a copy of it today. It's published by the British Library and in the United States by Hendrickson. And this is really fascinating to look at. It's a photo facsimile of that 1526 edition. Now the English authorities saw Tyndale's Bible as a threat to their authority and influence, and so they attempted to block its printing. However, in the next year, he was able to get 3,000 copies printed at underground presses in the Netherlands. Over 50,000 copies of his New Testament were printed and smuggled into England over the next 10 or so years. 
The fact that the average person could now read the message of God's love in his or her own language, not in Latin, was widely received and read within England. From then on, William Tyndale was a wanted man, staying one step ahead of the law. But finally, in 1536, he was betrayed by a friend and arrested by Dutch authorities. As his translation of the New Testament and then later portions of the Old Testament were spread throughout England, he came into conflict with the English church and government. In particular, one gentleman by the name of Sir Thomas More was a vocal opponent to Tyndale's work. More realized the danger of Tyndale's translation, and he drew attention to the way that Tyndale translated five words in particular. He was keenly aware that Tyndale's translation of these terms undermined the authority and the teachings of the church. Among the terms that Moore called attention to were the following. When Tyndale translated the word ecclesia in Greek as congregation, not the church, the meaning of the passages that contained this Greek term shifted from a reference to the church of Rome to that of a local gathering or congregation of believers. Metanoia in the Greek was translated as the practice of repentance, not the practice of penance. Presbyteros was no longer translated as priest, but as elder or senior in Tyndale's translation. Transformed the reader's understanding of church leadership. Now, both of these Greek terms, ecclesia and presbyteros, played a significant role in how Tyndale's readers would have perceived the nature of the church and how it was governed. It was now a local gathering of believers led by more mature believers, not priests. Instead of grace, which was dispensed through the church via the sacraments, Tyndale preferred divine favor for the Greek word charis. But the term that Sir Thomas More thought was the most inappropriate was Tyndale's choice of love instead of charity for agape. Moore objected to Tyndale's use of the verb love due to sexual connotations with this word during his day. Moore argued that Tyndale had reduced agape to the lewd love that is between some worthless fellow and his mate. Charity, by contrast, was the highest of Christian virtues in medieval Europe, greater than faith and love, according to 1 Corinthians 13. And it rightly played a prominent role in the teaching of the church in medieval society. Tyndale felt that the average person did not grasp the apostolic teaching on this term because of preconceptions associated with the term charity. By replacing it with the vernacular term love, he provoked his readers thinking, as was clearly demonstrated on Sir Thomas More's part, and he opened up new vistas for how they understand the New Testament. William Tyndale discerned that many of the doctrines that the Reform movement sought to correct in the church were based on how biblical passages were read and even more fundamentally on the way the very words in the text itself were translated. His translation opened the English reading world to the core of the Reformation theology and message and to a recovery of the apostolic message. The combined effect of this new conceptual vocabulary in his New Testament undermined the Church of Rome's teachings, authority, and practices within England. The body of Christ was now portrayed as a local congregation, not the church headed from Rome. It's led by an elder, not a priest, which removed the institutional claims of the Catholic Church. Salvation was now accomplished on the basis of God's divine favor towards us. It's received through the believer's faith and their repentance. This stands in contrast to the doctrine being taught that salvation was dispensed through the church in combination with the believer's faith through the administration of the sacraments by priests and doing acts of penance. There's a famous axiom that ideas have consequences, and the impact of Tyndale's translation was felt from the pulpits, in personal devotions, and in the university classroom as it was read both publicly and privately. In his doorstop of a book, 
the Bible in English, written by David Daniel, he writes, So the Bible in English, Tyndale's translation, is not only a source of doctrine, a text for exegesis, it itself is an agent of the greatest change in national as well as personal life. Many of the passages in our contemporary translations still bear the stamp of Tyndale's linguistic acumen. Phrases like, give us this day our daily bread in Matthew 6.11 are repeated almost verbatim in many of our translations. And I can also remember explaining to a student one time that the word grace meant God's unmerited favor towards us. In hindsight, I now realize that I was unknowingly quoting Tyndale's definition for the word grace. The influence of Tyndale's translation some 500 years ago had subconsciously shaped how I understand key Christian terms. Tyndale's labor as a linguist and a translator illustrates how one person's reading the Bible can have both an impact on his or her generation and continue to exercise an influence generation, even centuries later. As well as individual words, Tyndale also had a great ear for turning phrases. Some of these that we still use today in English were coined by him. For example, my brother's keeper. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. A moment in time. Fashion not yourselves to the world. Seek, and ye shall find. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Let there be light. The powers that be, the salt of the earth. A law unto themselves. It came to pass. The signs of the times. All of these phrases demonstrate the impact that Tyndale still has on us even down to this day. But not content to merely translate the Bible, Tyndale also criticized Henry VIII when he annulled his marriage to Catherine of Aragon so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. Now for somebody who's on the run from the law, it's not a wise thing to go around and antagonize the king even more. Even though Tyndale was living and hiding in Antwerp at that time, the king used his political allies there to have Tyndale arrested and finally have him charged with heresy. In 1536, Tyndale was found guilty and sentenced to be burned to death by the Dutch authorities. However, his executioner showed him a great act of kindness at the last minute. Right before the pyre was to be lit beneath his feet, the executioner strangled Tyndale, then his body was burned. However, Tyndale's translation proved to be too popular. Within four years, King Henry even gave permission for the English translations to be published in England. One of the reasons why England swung Protestants so quickly was in large part due to Tyndale's translation. The lasting influence of his work is felt down to this day. For example, it's estimated that over 85% of the New Testament portion of the King James Bible and 75% of the Old Testament was based on Tyndale's translation. So what's a person's life worth? In a certain sense, you can say that Tyndale's life was worth five words. Five words, just five words. But those five words changed history which really complicates how we judge the contribution of a person. What are five simple little words worth? Well, in certain contexts, they don't make much of a difference. But in other contexts, they are absolutely beyond price. I hope you enjoyed this short dive into history and the life of William Tyndale and his impact. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. That is one way to really help me in growing the channel and let more people know about it on the platform of YouTube. That's how they recommend and let other people know that this is a good video. Until next week, peace.